think. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our stupid fucking show. of anusia, of congenital anusia, uh, and uh, people like this really can't tell one tune from another. Lermit told me that if music was played, he could either say this was the Marseillaise or it wasn't. automatic doors swish open. I stride into the room and all eyes are upon me. Softly I scan right to left, searching for her. Of course I do not yet know who she is. One never knows. Is she the lovely brunette reading Mirabelle by the window? The young mother stroking her daughter's hair near the vending machines? The elegant older lady absorbed in thought by the doors to radiology? I pick, I pick up, up the, the women, women in the burn wall waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn wall waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn wall waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn wall waiting room. It is she. Ah, yes, the vision by the plastic ferns, staring blankly at a little house on the prairie we run. Her left arm is thrust tight with the gauze and the ace bandages, and I am sure her face will be fully healed as soon as the hair grows back. I approach. 
I take a seat close to this large little flower, but not too close. Discreetly, I ask, so my little daffodil, tell me, what brings you here? I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. She slaps me. I was prepared for this. It is not the first time I've been slapped. With dignity I rise. And the light. Beside the graceful beauty by the coffee machine. Why, my lovely, I say, your your dressings must be replaced. This will never do. The the pass is irrigating in rivulets down your pretty little neck and shoulders. Please, allow me, I say, blotting at the drainage with a cocktail napkin. I pick, I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. I pick up the women in the burn ward waiting room. She slaps me. Unfazed, I saunter to the sublime young lady reposing on a gurney by the admissions desk. There is an unaffected languor to her pose which renders delicately undressed, but Vaseline-slathered third-degree burns on 80% of her body. I shall not trouble you now, sweet one, I whisper to this delicate creature. But perhaps later, when your physical therapy has had some success, you would consider giving me a telephone call. Here is my card. Here's the one. Here's the one. The man of all men. The man of all the men. To say so is no perjury. She says nothing. Clearly there has been smoke inhalation, and the little lovely is close to coma. It is just as well. I can see that with one batting of her singed eyelids, these princess would have broken my heart. But there are always the other fish to fry, no? I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick, I pick up the, the women, women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick, I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. I pick up the women in the burn ward wedding room. That was not on key. At 7.15 p.m. in Chesterton, three people were in communion with the great nothing. Catherine Bradshaw, 46, would euphorically blank on a bed in room 315 of County General, her daughter's hand clutched tense in her own. Taxol slid to an impotent stop in her arteries along with a white cell depleted of blood. Six weeks earlier, a scan had shown that the ovarian cancer had metastasized to a colon. Two weeks before that, the lungs. Now Catherine's vision was a solipsistic blast of light squeezing off the room, the family nearby, her daughter's grip on her palm. A flood of glutamate was pushed into her asphyxiating neurons, igniting an ecstatic surge of good feeling in that fading mind. Torching the last of their oxygen, the cells fired erratically as elsewhere in the body fluids ceased their traffic and muscle tone died. She became aware of a presence a perception of forward motion, and together these feelings produced in her a sense of union, merger. It was her father. Catherine was aware of her father. Aware of her father. Aware of... Catherine was aware of... Toby Nichols' fists were on either side of the garbage can as another surge came up from the diaphragm. He squeezed his leaking eyes shut and dropped a third stream of vomit. 
that was it, maybe that was it, maybe there wasn't any more. He fell down by the fence, a track of spume wending down his chin, and tenderly tested it, closing his eyes to see if the spinning would come back. He made one or two exhausted attempts at sobbing, then flicked his palm to dislodge a piece of broken glass beneath it. And there was... There was... Leaden... It was the last thing he knew. Down on Anderson Field, Eric Hodgkiss had taken the ball and was making for the goalpost. Dick Ramsey closed the ground between them at an oblique angle and threw himself in for a tackle. And then, a jarring fluke. Eric's shoulder came down hard on the sod, turned and wrenched the neck into two pieces at the nape. Eric's body flopped down a rag doll by the head and set to spasming like a speared fish. The first thing that crossed Eric's mind was cheese sandwiches. He remembered something about the cheese sandwiches his mom made when he was a boy before he grew up to be captain of the football team. Cheese sandwiches and eating out Missy Bradshaw. He really liked eating out Missy Bradshaw. The soft moan she would release from under bit lip. But Missy wasn't even out of the stands that night, off with mother instead. She wasn't even watching him now that this strange, huge, sudden thing had happened to him and his body was disjunct from itself and draped crazy on the turf so confusing and what the hell was going on anyway cheese sandwiches and the hard orange seat they used to keep in the corner of the kitchen eric ate on the hard orange chair studying the american president's placemat on the table before him listening to his mother at her strange industry of opening cupboard after cupboard and pulling the refrigerator door to and fro eric had his cheese sandwich his cheese sandwich. Eric had his cheese sandwich. self-replicate. The cytoplasm grows its mass to twice its former state. The century old divides in two and floats to either side. And when the nuclear skin breaks down, the cell will now divide. Microtubular fibrils form from cytoplasmic shoals By the chromosomes in center cell, the centrioles and poles It's prophase of cell division, baby It's prophase of cell division, baby It's prophase of cell division, baby It's To the fibrils on the central's longer plane Held just by the central mirror at the junction of each X The chromosomes are ripped in pairs as the fibrils start to flex It's better phase of cell division, baby It's better phase of cell division, baby The 
just kicking harder now as the chromosomes are drawn from the center of the old cell to the centers of its spawn. It's anaphase of cell division, baby. My grandma helped make me wise She told me to be respectful And not to tell lies She told me love's like a river Ever surging and strong Links the ocean's coarse currents With snowy mountain top calm Oh, love is a river A river flowing Fed by precipitation Run off Oh, love is a river Love is a river Oh, love is a river Sometimes fed too by an elevated aquifer Driving spring water through permeable bedrock channels There are many types of Some are deep and slow And that says love's like a river There are so many kinds One river may flow straight While one curves and winds Oh, love is a river A river flowing Some in the delts and estuaries Others underground in the limestone car, fluvial caverns Where other roads to subterranean lithostratic 
stratigraphic formations. Oh, love is a river. The third longest one in the world is the Yangtze. Oh, love is a river. Its gradient declines over geologic time unless rejuvenated by tectonic uplift. Oh, love is a river. Its surface chemistry varies from that of its hyperferic zone when brown water mixing occurs there. Love is a river. Drink hair of the dog when I wake up. Tequila sunrise as I dress. A screwdriver cup with my ham and my eggs, and one more on commute on the left. I drink bourbon and Bailey's with coffee. In boardrooms, a stiff cocktail glass. Three martinis at lunch, all with pancreas and twists, and some wine at the afternoon mass. I drink happy hour stouts at the pub house. After tea sale, my main meal. Then after I dine, it's a fine dessert wine, and I start up my drinking for real. I drink hot toddy gin, rummy up, and all the rum and tummy bucket, and the rum and tea, kill two to keep it beer and wine, and straight up liquor 151 to give me jitters. Russians black and Russians white, and still moonshine to fly my sight. Bloody Mary celery steak, schnapps and sake boost the face. Single malt and blended scotch Late night till I lose my watch Every clear and coolly chardonnay Polke, pimps and pimps all day Sex on the beach and cement mixers Swill it all till tongue gets blisters Absinthe and boot till fire More and more talk on some Harm Alcohol Liquor I like to drink I drink Six liters of liquor for leaving One more on the road for the way Barely the strength left to nightcap myself for resting to drink more next day. <laughs> oh. Wednesday, 7.30 a.m., staring down a face in the mirror compounded out of hungry tentacles and the dregs of last night's drunk. Scraping away at the thing with a worn-out razor. My face wants a cup of coffee. My face wants four hours more sleep. My face wants a cheese omelet and hash browns. My face wants to lose about ten pounds. And somehow, all at once, my face wants never to smoke a cigarette again. My face already wants to be five years younger and would like to have back some of its hair. My face wants to donate time to the homeless, money to AIDS research, it wants to be a better informed voter. My face wants to study cello. My face wants to quit its day job and live out the affluence of spontaneity in some bohemian niche of Amsterdam. My face really wants to quit its day job. My face would like to be a better conversationalist, should probably have more friends, and should enjoy life more. My face should stop writing tacitly depressive broadsides. My face should go find some nice girl and stop being so pissy about things. My face needs to go to grad school. It should better realize its full income potential. It should revise that goddamn novel it wrote and should travel the world, have raucous sex, be an astronaut, paint, 
study foreign languages, imbibe strange drugs, develop broader tastes, and did I mention that my face should find some nice girl? My face needs to get a new razor. My face needs to hurry its ass up. It's late for work. pushes open the front door at one o'clock Saturday morning, letting her bag drop to the floor and herself right after it. She could have made it to the bedroom. She could even have taken a shower first. But 14 hours of walking omelets and Coca-Colas out of one room and porting back the scraped skeletons of the plates and cups that had borne them. Those 14 hours had left her in a mood of self-indulgence. Anna felt like falling prone to the floor and losing consciousness a while. So, she did! She kicked the door closed behind her and slammed down on her knees, then her shoulders. She slept. 20 minutes, she slept. It's half past one and Anna's pacing the apartment. She's exhausted, wants to sleep, but she feels the restlessness of home aloneness, the restlessness of a world out there in the throes of Saturday's rage and ecstasy. 14 hours of omelets weighing on her brow and still the night bothers her. Well, why shouldn't it? Two blocks away, a couple is making love. They're crazy about one another. They want to fall into each other's flesh like a vortex of energy draining into a black hole. Forever nearer, forever slower, forever closer to singularity. Ah, oh, horse shit. What was she thinking about? It's quarter to two on a Saturday. Half the town is starting to wonder if it was about to puke, and the other half was sitting home alone in boxer shorts watching infomercials. Where are these happy people? Where are they? The ones whose lives are such a lush portrait of striving and reward that they make Anna want to slash open her own breast with the longing, rip loose her heart, and toss it out wantonly into the world. Where are these people who aren't alone? And how do I sign up? She'd be able to see Kirsten again in a couple of days. Anna had Tuesday off. Mom had called the other day and said Kirsten made an A in history, but wasn't so hot in math, and Dr. Klinger said that she'd be needing braces before the summer. Well, where was that $800 going to be coming from? Anna's mom was straining her fixed income as it was, and Kirsten, honey, your mama made 62 bucks in tips for the 14 hours she worked today. Looks like it's crooked teeth for you, darling. The prep school boys are going to shun you for your ugliness, and you'll be knocked up at 18 by a technical school dropout whose whereabouts will become unknown shortly after he mutters something about landing a factory job in Lansing. Just like your mommy, little Kirsten. Just like your mommy. And then what happens to the English degree you'd wanted to earn? Then what happens to the picture you'd nurse for years in the back of your head? Morning sunlight in the window, fresh sheets, the baby nestled between you and whatever his name is going to turn out to be, that intelligent and caring man who wanted nothing more than to make his life the same one as yours. Kirsten, you might just have to give up on all that stuff. Because Mommy can't pull together 800 bucks right now for the orthodontist. Dull ache is on in Anna's feet. She pauses to resent the fact that work is allowed to linger after she's off the clock. She wanted to call Kirsten, ask trite questions about her schoolwork, and are there any cute boys in class? to ask in a happy voice, hiding tears as they slink down her cheeks, but it was quarter to two on a Saturday. Kirsten, she whispered, the, the, be careful as you grow up. Will you do that? Anna drew a deep breath. She went to take a shower. Friends are there when you need them, but also when you don't. Some people need 
support in life, but if you're strong, you won't. It's great to be an asshole. It's great to be an asshole. Cause when you're an asshole, you don't have to care. How goddamn long can I sit in this apartment? My only solace is drinking myself to sleep. Problem is, I keep waking back up. And who could tell the difference between five days and six? I pull off the bottle angry about something, so I swallow more than I'm ready for. It squirts back up and I grimace it down. Then that old raw feeling at the crest of the esophagus, eyes watering over. Oof! I grunt. I've only been up half an hour, but I'm trashed. Toss a few shots on that background B A L, and you are right back there in the tube, yes, sir. If that phone finally rang, I'd be four days too pissed to pick it up. But it's not gonna ring. We know by now, it's not gonna ring. I hear a ship passing by, horn blowing like the Lusitania, and annoyed to remember there is an external world. I taped black plastic garbage bags over the windows days ago and have no sense of time. For the last three days, probably, Maybe more, I have refused to turn on any of the lights in here. To be safe, I move through the apartment on all fours. Because I need to be safe. But you know, in this darkness, if that phone did ring right now, I wouldn't even be able to find it in time. I just thought of that. Wouldn't be able to find it in time. I'm wildly dehydrated and crawl off for the bathroom where I draw one clamber inside and lie there fetal, sucking up the water as the bottle drifts and bobs beside me. Maybe I sleep a few minutes, maybe not. Eventually I let the water drain and lie there shivering myself dry. I don't know how long it's been since I've eaten. There were some saltines a while back. I crawl toward the kitchen, but uh, veer instead toward the living room. I, I can't eat anything. Now with that goddamn light that clicks on in the refrigerator? When I was a kid, I was given a novelty pen. It has a little battery-operated light on the business end for Stygian note scrawling. I found it, day or two back in an old coffee mug stuffed with chewed pencils and snap lengths of rubber band. 12, 15 years old that thing's gotta be, and who would have guessed that the light still works? It is an attenuated little glow, a dismal, cellophane-y sort of light, and doesn't disagree too much with my eyes. I put on a pair of sunglasses from time to time and use the pen to scrawl pointless notes like this one on the wall. Tell you what, sometimes I dream I'm the cartoon man stranded on that island with one palm tree. All he's got is a pen. And let's not forget the bottle. Anyway. 
he writes down his message on old coconut husks on the tree. Then he climbs inside that bottle and throws himself into an unending ocean. And what do you think they're going to find first? A lost message on an aisle or an infinitesimal vodka bottle floating the surface of an unsoundable abyss. You tell me. You tell me. You tell me because I'd really like to know. You think she's gonna call? Hey, I'll tell you something about extraordinary. Sustain your life to the perfect absence of purpose. Be a message in a bottle. That's raw goddamn pathos for you in a biscuit tin. But any doing good because deep down in the end, don't we all really love an idiot? He's funny. He combines cunning and low wit with self-defeat. Entertains us by doing stupid things we wouldn't do ourselves. Everybody loves a clown. Everybody loves a clown. the experiment. What time is it, Mike asked? Four o'clock, she said. It's five already, he exclaimed. Four, she repeated, holding up the flat of her hand with the thumb folded down. 
Now, Bobo had been on a heavy regime of cognitive enhancers for several weeks now, and was able to understand the human speech pretty easily. After all, they spent hours each day just trying to teach him this stuff. But this exchange triggered a cascade of epiphanies in the little ape. Suddenly, he knew that the four raised fingers, the sound four, and that symbol on the longer stick was pointing to on the wall clock, were all instances of an underlying abstract concept that could be used to count units of time just as well as bananas. In the Promethean fire of that moment, Bobo saw it. A web of meanings and communicative intentions is what these humans do, and in those meanings, their power. The power allowing Mike and Janelle to leave at 5 o'clock each day while he languished on in cage four. That night, Bobo noticed a notched flat stick on the table near his cage, and a little further out, one of those piles of thin sheets stuck together along one side. Bobo dragged the book toward himself with the ruler. Each sheet was plastered in symbols. It helped that the symbols were often positioned by pictures of familiar objects. Soon, Bobo had deduced that the circular sign, for instance, represented the noise oh. The stick meant an O, or sometimes an I, if there was a little dot on top. Within a few hours, he was picking out whole words, and by dawn, Bobo had read the dictionary in full. By far, its most intriguing entry was the one for the word lock. It was a little schematic picture given of tumblers behind a keyhole plate. It occurred to Bobo that if you inserted a small, thin implement through that keyhole with just the right twist, you might force those tumblers to turn and the cage door to open. Bobo waited through another day of injections, pills, fruit, and utterly puerile flashcard lessons. He pretended to make weak associations between pictures and objects, hand signs and actions, masking true awareness as he had gotten adept at doing for the past few weeks. The five o'clock was on its way, yes, on its way, and he had managed to swipe a hairpin from Janelle during a chaotic moment in the bathtub. By 5.30, Bobo was alone in the lab, trotting toward the exit. He wasn't too sure what he'd do when he got outside, but it would have to be better than what was going on in that cage. But he paused by the desk, where he noticed a formal proposal lay. The influence of cognitive enhancement and directed monoamine modulation on language acquisition and cognitive function in higher non-human primates. Sounded like an interesting read, so Bobo sat at the desk and flipped through. It was a description of his experiment, detailing what drugs were being given to him and how often, and what their expected effects were. One thing Bobo realized right away was that if he left the lab and stopped getting the drugs, he would quickly lose hold of the fascinating insights he'd been having lately about human symbol-making behavior. Another thing that caught Bobo's attention was that in a couple of weeks they were going to kill him and cut his brain into slabs. To say the least, this seemed to pose something of a dilemma. few nights, Bobo figured out how to hack his way into the main server of the National Science Administration. He'd already dug into Mike's and Janelle's data files and falsified several of their key findings with bias toward the expected results. During peer review, the falsified data would almost certainly come to light and wreck their careers. But this simply wasn't enough. Call him silly, but Bobo was determined to prevent having his brain cut into slabs. It took Bobo three whole nights to figure out how to shut down funding on his experiment. The NSA's accounting figures were deeply encrypted, and he couldn't review, much less manipulate them, until he created a new branch of mathematics and topographical number theory. Applying some ideas, from Lee algebras to Poincaré's Betty numbers analyzed within the framework of Files point set topology, Bobo was able to zero out funding for pure primate cognitive research and redirect those funds toward research into the effects of primate cognitive enhancement on sexual function. Well, it wasn't long before Mike and Janelle were off teaching high school biology somewhere, and Bobo was set up in capacious digs with a small harem of cognitively enhanced female chimpanzees. At first, he demonstrated to his new group of researchers that yes, cognitive enhancement puts an enormous boost on primate sexual function. It was, to say the least, an idyllic arrangement for little Bobo, who could sneak out of his cell at nights and look up all the latest developments in super string theory on the internet, even publishing an anonymous monograph of his own from time to time. But alas, in just a few short weeks, the cognitive enhancers took hold of the females as well, who got smart and stopped letting Bobo jump on top of them so often. Next time, you'd have to be a little bit more careful in setting the parameters of these experiments. We've 
I've gone out on 2.5 dates And I think that you're really great It's getting that time of the year When Christmas is drawing quite near The only thing I want for Christmas The thing I'd like from you for Christmas The only thing I want for Christmas Is a nice dinner date laid. Wait, what did you just say? Um, you go first. I was just saying it's been nice getting to know you, at a decent pace, and I didn't think that we should feel obligated to go all out with big gifts. So, what did you say? <laughs> you know, I... The, the only, only thing, thing I, I want for Christmas, Christmas The thing I'd like from you for Christmas The only thing I want for Christmas Is some Thai or Tex-Mex. Sex. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, what do you want? Uh, mittens? E- earmuffs? <laughs> really, a gift certificate to Starbucks. Small, it doesn't matter. Are you sure? You know one thing I really want <laughs> is to hear fewer Christmas songs. <laughs> I know. Especially the cutesy ones that try to be funny. Totally. Drives me nuts. So, what did you say? Well... I'd love to spend some time with you. That's not what you said. If you're busy, a rain check would do. You didn't say that either. What counts most with gifts is the thought. Uh Uh-huh. Regardless if it was store-bought. The The only only thing thing I I want for Christmas. The thing I'd I'd like from you for Christmas. The only thing I want for Christmas. Is a nice dinner date. get laid. Okay, seriously. What did you say you want? A quiet dinner, maybe a movie. <laughs> How about I just nail you to the wall through every aperture you've got so hard that you won't be able to walk till New Year's? Done. Blah. <laughs> Wash those dishes, whore. Push those papers, whore. Make those phone calls, tap that keyboard, roll them biscuits, whore. Haul those products, whore. Pick that cotton, whore. Research that market, mop them toilets, prune those saplings, whore. All employees must sign in and out of the front desk when taking their 10-minute breaks at 10.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. Personal phone calls are allowed only at that time. All employees must be neatly groomed and in professional attire. All employees will receive 48 hours morning leave in the event of the death of their children. People with jobs. People with jobs. People with jobs. Go arrest those criminals, whore! Assure that quality, whore! Teach those children love it up there! Oversee that p whore! Break that software, whore! Drive that city bus, whore! Construct those turnpikes, screen those candidates, teach that diversity training class, whore! May I help you? Would you care for anything to drink with that? Yes, sir, right away, sir! I'm a highly motivated self-starter who craves a high-stress, results-driven work environment, and I definitely regard myself a people person. People with jobs, people with jobs, people with jobs, they're fucking idiots. They're fucking idiots. They're fucking idiots. Design those graphics, watch the security monitor, whore. Make those heroes, whore. Tighten that fan belt, whore. Criticize that artwork, pour that coffee. Write that pills for twice when you search the blood of the urban poor, whore. I hope you can stay a little late this evening. We just got back the report on the Jenkins account and need to go over some of the sales figures. Shouldn't take more than five hours. Now, I don't want to sound nitpicky, but this is the second time this year you've been almost five minutes late. That's not going to continue, is it? People with jobs, people with jobs, people with jobs, they're fucking idiots, they're fucking idiots, they're fucking idiots, they're fucking idiots!
Day two, probably June five. I can manage the pain if I'm careful to stay still. The heat is incredible. I have maybe half a gallon of water left. Some beef jerky. Shouldn't last more than a day. Too painful. I'll try to write more later. Day three. I have trouble seeing the trail clearly from where I'm lying. I think the motorcycle landed behind some sagebrush along the slope. It'd be a miracle if it weren't total, but I can't even crawl to it anyway, much less ride the thing. I, I'm worried about the leg. Immense purple welt around the brake. A lot of internal bleeding, but I think it's stable. Could go necrotic and poison me before I'm found. But they should find me, I shouldn't, they? I mean, it's been three days, and they'd be looking after the first. Of course, I do realize I drove very far out. And not exactly on the route I told Randy I'd be taking. So boring out here. Hot. Mouth dry. Day four. I'm saving my last swallow and a half of water as though so small an amount could tip things one way or the other. I've never been so hungry. There are some berries on the bush at the bottom of the gorge, I think, but it's almost 15 feet away and I can scarcely imagine crawling so far. Of course, I pray they'll find me first and we'll come to that. Marion, if it comes to... Well, there are a few things that I'd like to... Not yet. They'll find me. They'll find me. Day six. I'm gonna have to crawl for those bushes. I want to see you again. Marion, and I'm gonna crawl for the bushes. The thirst is unimaginable. They could actually... They could see me more clearly from the trail if I were there by those bushes anyway. Day seven. Pain relentless. Dry cough. I made it. Halfway to the bushes. Overturned a snake under a nest of rocks. A baby. Bite wasn't too deep. In just the calf. I sucked madly for an hour. But I've been dizzy. Haven't felt too well dizzy. And uh, conf confused and scared. My God. I'm not sure I'm going to make it through this. Day eight. Saw a man out on the trail last night. He stood at the edge of the outcropping in the darkness, glaring into me with stony eyes, and at first I tried to raise a horse, cry to him for help, but I paused. Something horrible about the man, sinister. I wished I could run or, or hide. I don't know. I don't know. There was... I was dreaming. Maybe. The very substance of the world is, is, is seething, veins in my hands crawling, shifting over each other like worms. The grit of the earth crawling, the clouds snaking out, dizzying vortices overhead. I dry heave from time to time. I'm afraid of the dark coming on, of what I might see. Day 10. Why would you leave me like this, Marion? Marion, why would you leave me all night? You said they were coming all night, that I was saved all night. Touching me like that, Marion, you pressed your lips to me and said they were coming. Please, Christ, why did you leave? I was covered in maggots, the sky rain blood. Marion, why did... Day 10, I was able to pick and eat 26 ants, fell to weeping sometime after noon, and licked the sweet, wet tears from my cheeks. I feel gluttonous and overstuffed. I feel muttonous and lumber-cuffed. Handshake and quicksand, do they rhyme? I'm trying to um, make up a poem, and I, I can't remember if they rhyme. There are 17 syllables in a haiku. Which is why there are 17 justices on the Supreme Court. I was thinking if um, you could somehow take the pain out of things, then people would hurt less. 
day nine, which is uh, still the same day as the day before. When I was a boy and daddy clipped that old dog with his Ford on the county road, I remember he looked at me hard and he said, there's things you have to do, son. Then he took the rifle off the rack and put a round in the head of that poor old dog. Where are you now, daddy? Where are you now? Where are you when I need you most? Day 19. I walked up on the trail earlier today, mounted the bike, and I drove her on down to the stream, where there was a pitcher of cold beer and a big basket of club sandwiches. I confess I almost jumped off the old hog and dug in, but it, it hit me, you know. I miss it back there by the bush. So I revved her on back and sat back down here, and I like it. There is the glorious peace of solitude. There is golden rays of light. The, the, the ground beneath me is alive like butter sucking soft at my ass, consoling me, and I always pack a mean heart on. And those angels, those the, the angels, they work such lovely ellipses in the sky above. Those angels, those angels, those I want you to know that I love you. Day six, one hundred or the other. I, uh, I can't remember how to write anymore. I have to think the ideas down onto the page. And I am full with such joy that words could never touch it. Oh, mine father, lay thine staff upon me. I have seen the, the hidden folk clambering from the rocks and ravines where they hide. They tell me things, such wonders of the world, they tell me it all. The bitch demon, Ashtaroth, laid with me last night. She will bear me a son who will go on to become governor of Vermont. God, there is such joyous laughter all around. Where does it even come from? The, the land about me crowded with merry faces. I love them all. There is such happiness and, and, and such happiness and streaming down on me from the heavens like a liquid ecstasy rolling upon and through me like I don't even exist anymore. Like I, I don't even exist anymore. Like I am seeping slowly outward into a universe full of love. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy.
Papers found at the ruins of the World Trade Center. Career objective, to stimulate bottom line earnings growth in an expanding securities firm with dynamic market capitalization, proven dedication to excellence, substantial performance-based compensation, and a nice cocktail party now and again. You don't have to be crazy to work here, but you do to be one of the managers. The General Department Code 8142 can no longer be used for making copies. The code has been abused by making copies for specific departments or personal purposes. You now must always use your own specific copy code for making your copies. Thanks, Jenny. Only once over time, as I've wandered through life, have I encountered a woman I was proud to call wife. Together we go, facing joys and some sorrows, happy to plan for our many tomorrows. Love you, honey. Happy 38th, Max. July 14, 2001. Although we regret to inform you that another candidate was chosen from the pool of highly qualified applicants, we will keep your resume on file for six months to determine if another opening arises matching your knowledge, skills, and abilities. Thank you very much for your interest in Atherton and Brook, World Trade Center Tower 2, 106th floor, New York, New York. Oh my God, they killed Kenny! You bastards. Driving interest in a stricter enforcement of the associated protocols. Careful adherence to this practice can only result in substantial performance enhancement in the medium term, heading into Q4 of 1998, and a concomitant increase of market share extending into the following year on the sigmoid paradigm. Burns 1994, Weber and Axel 1997B. Any leftovers in the fridge will be thrown out every Friday. This means you. Congratulations from the whole team, Rhonda. If you make for half the mom that you are a coworker, Amy's gonna grow up a very happy kid. Dear recipient, not all managers in today's competitive marketplace have the discerning eye and forward-reaching outlook that you do. This is why we know you'll jump at the opportunity to get a leg up on other investment management firms in your area of specialization. Elworthy, Melissa, $47.63, 82298. Fabreau, William P, $112.83, 8, Fenton. Buddy, $38.06, Cutters Wharf Circle, Trenton, New Jersey, $1,628.48, also available in beige. AB4128, Swing Line Stapler Model 17C, $22.95. CF93B, Replacement Cartridge 4 Count, $17.95. AB9120, Highland Staple Remover Model 6, $5.95. 16, 22, 18, 48, 12, 17, 22, 8, 16, 2, 1, 1, 1. about four blocks down the road, staring with drunken stolidity at the zigzagging sidewalk, when a terrific slam pounded through the air. First I thought someone let off a shotgun coming over a crest in the street, and I saw a virgin car accident splayed across the intersection a block up. I doubled my stride, stomping erratically from the building's walls to the curb and back again. The scene was fresh. No police, no paramedics, and at 2.30 in the morning, no glazed-eyed onlookers either. Just an automobile rammed up over the median into the trunk of a streetlight. Another tossed haphazardly into a bank of mailboxes and newspaper machines 50 yards down the cross street. Just these two things and me. All of us pulsing erratically in the blinking light of the car's half-disconnected headlamp. It occurred to me that I had no desire to help. I didn't want to call 911, spread encouragement or sympathy to the victims, or hear last confession from a stranger's trembling, bloody lips. Not that I'd refuse to do these things if occasion demanded it, but for me, the principal thing was just to witness something awful. 
The car on the median I could see as I approached it lunged halfway up the length of its own hood, accordion style. Its doors were flapped open like snapped limbs, and it had vomited a constellation of chrome and clear plastic shards on the median before it. Still larger detritus was the pair of boys that looked like brothers lying by the gutter twenty yards away, draped on the pavement like stalks of threshed corn or slabs of meat at the deli counter. All I could figure was that they thought the gas tank might blow these boys and cleared out when they had the strength. They couldn't possibly have been thrown to that spot during the crash. Both of them were rigid, shoulders taut, as they quivered with shock. About a hundred yards off, near the car embedded in the newspaper racks, there was shouting. I looked up to see the drivers confronting each other. They'd been blocked from view by the corner before. Stepping around the boys at the curb, I drifted toward the median and watched the two men from by the wrecked car. One of them, the larger of the two, was sanding out his vocal cords on a belt of obscenities. In the middle of his tirade, he stripped off his tight t-shirt and tossed out on the trunk of his car. I turned back, dreamlike, to glance at the boys in the gutter they hadn't moved. I should probably find a phone and go call 911, I thought. When I looked back at the two men, I saw the shirtless one had a knife in his hand now. It glinted as he waved it side to side. The other man took a limping step backward, but was too proud to walk away. A car came up the street, rubbernecked through the intersection, it didn't stop. About halfway up the next block, a homeless man was pushing a shopping cart toward us. tentative step from the wrecked car. I glanced down at the boys again. I wonder where the nearest phone is, I muttered aloud. I craned my head over his shoulder to continue watching the two men as I set down the road. They kept shouting, kept staggering out a loose orbit around the knife. Pretty nasty accident, the homeless man commented over the rattle of his cart. Can you spare some change tonight? Anything. A nickel? A dime? I'll take pennies. Sorry, I whispered, too quietly for him to hear, but loud enough to make me feel polite. My feet thudded on the sidewalk as I walked, hard, scanning the blocks ahead for phone booths. I was gripped still by the glassy-eyed stupidity that informs a drunken man's steps. I dreaded the onus of trying to help. I dreaded the long bus ride home. I dreaded the sick sleep and weary wakening into the bosom of Sunday's gloom. I wanted to crawl into a soft, dark place somewhere and quit myself of this world. The city's lights cast a brassy haze into low-lying clouds. The streets are faintly luminescent, ethereal. I wondered if the two boys were badly hurt. I hadn't seen any blood, but there was a peculiar attitude to their limbs. Arms and legs may or may not be broken. The boys may or may not be hemorrhaging. The man may or may not have cut the other man with his knife by now. I was all heavy feet and sludged head, all acrid taste and sick stomach, all swimming eyes and tunnel vision. My mind, fixed on a field trip I'd taken to a slaughterhouse as a senior in high school. It was a strangely Dante-esque experience, moving slowly closer through tiers of horror to the nexus of it all, the kill floor. We had passed great marbled rows of carcasses, pig heads leaning from steel spikes, roaring machines stuffing lengths of intestine full of pork scraps, cauldrons of strange and stinking lipids. At our odyssey's end lay the stagnant, fleshy air of the kill room itself. Cattle rolled in on hooks, a ceiling runner, skulls, bolt gun just 30 seconds before. A bland, masked man sawed a line down the animals' bellies and bled them over a greasy grate. Tributaries and small creeks of blood, bearing mats of hair and gobs of fat, formed at his feet. The biggest thing these guys have to worry about, we were being told, is cutting their own selves. 
You get so warm, sticking your hands in all that fresh kilt meat. You can cut yourself. Don't know it till it's had 15 minutes, half an hour to get infected. My attention snapped back to the road. There, finally, was my payphone at the end of a cross street block. I broke into a light jog, hopping over a split box heaped with rotting cabbage. It dawned on me that I had made no effort to remember what the cross street had been back there. Had it been Van Ness and Eddie? Or was it Turk, Hyde, Golden Gate? Tearing the receiver from the hook, I cradled it under my cheek and stabbed in 911. The line was dead. Could have guessed as much. Three unseemly individuals compounded from the shadows down the block and moved slowly up the street toward me. Suddenly the neighborhood's unlit expanse and decimated facades appeared sinister and hopeless. I doubled back toward the main avenue. Three minutes. Five went by. What time is it now? How long have I been walking around like this? It's three o'clock in the morning. I'm cruising the edge of the tenderloin for no reason. Maybe it's past three. It'll take at least 40 minutes to get back to my room from here. I'm exhausted, anxious, sick with an expansive and undirected dread. I wonder if anything's on TV this time of day. And I wonder if that man got stabbed. If those kids will be okay. If the little piggies will get safe to market. A cruiser must have happened on the scene. Or somebody with a cell phone had driven past. Surely someone somewhere was taking care of everything. Someone somewhere was making sure everything would be okay. Ten a.m. I'm rolling headache and slab face from bed. I am wearing one sock and my underwear is on backward. Hair's a greasy shock, eyes shot, right hand trembling, just a little. I'm subject to a dehydration so acute that at this moment I am both literally and metaphorically a fire hazard. Feet hit the floor and I pull out a bottle off the nightstand, pour off a couple fingers. The stuff's a damn sight from pleasant to me just now, but necessity is, after all, necessity. 
You know what they say, he who drinks the most liquor in this life wins, and fuck's sake, if I'm gonna be dead by 30, then I better start acting like it. Could use a goddamn quart of milk. Could use a goddamn slap in the face. Could use a goddamn reason to get up in the morning. I assume I was out being an ass last night. Since there was a spotty pall of blackout drawn across the evening. Something about chatting up a Norwegian chick in the bar after night looked promising, but no go. The pervasive timelessness. Napping at a bus stop. Car wreck out in the road. Rapping with that homeless man by his dumpster somewhere. I talked with him a minute or an hour. I could believe for just that moment that he really was trying to get clean and move back to Oklahoma. Scratch my belly, ten pounds over sags it is, and stare glassily at the floor with tumbler in hand. Why the hell is my underwear on back? Promising myself to nap after I rise and slip on last night's clothes. There's gotta be a quart of milk for me out there somewhere. Front door opens. It's sunny out, shocking after the dank room and blazing to beat blue hell. I'm not at all sure I like this world this morning. I feel somehow glad to be in it. Market Street draws me like the chance at reckoning, the hope of balance, the possibility of one night's drunk set right on the morning's quart of milk. And here come all the faces, rippling and turbulating one to another in a non-stop organic tapestry. A man whose mottled nose and discolored visage are cobbled with scabs. A woman bearing poise and pomp like shields, a defense so virtuosic it's lost need for opponents. An angry man, a face lean and guttered, throwing incoherent hate at all of us like a thousand darts. A boy with a sultry pout and a hearsed unconcern, struggling to be even self-important. A strangely angelic man with a winding beard stained yellow, stretched out sleeping by his bottle of rot gut. Diminutive Chinese matron surfacing on the sidewalk for a moment to hustle her groceries from one unseen world to another, leaving plumes of fish stink incense behind her. A girl whose eyes say she still thinks happiness is the human default. And for this moment, for some reason, I, I am in love with them all. I want to fall on these faces like a voyeur, an accountant, a sincere and ardent fucker. Every face is a cunt I want to draw it close and tongue kiss. For moments as I pass the faces, I feel married to each one. A lifetime coiled up in a three-tenths of a second. I, I regale them with what I have. I probe their wisdom. Slather them in small talk. Raise children with them. Grip their frightened, deathbed hands. Just to see it. See them open to me for this moment. I'm in raptures. I'll never so much as speak to any of these people. I have far too much to tell them. And nothing at all to say.
Bye.